Uh, well, it is a very great joy uh, and uh, privilege to be with you um, this evening, and I'm grateful to uh, Charlie for the invitation to address you and for your welcome. Um, in Australia, our national census results have uh, been released this year and indicate that 39% of Australians uh, now consider that they have no religion. And only 44% of Australians identify as Christians. Uh, this is the first time that fewer than 50% of Australians have nominated Christianity as their religion, uh, compared, say, to 100 years ago when 98% of Australians would have said they were Christians. Uh, this doesn't mean, of course, as you might guess, that there's been a sort of sudden collapse uh, in the life of the church. It means that many Australians who never went to church have decided to stop saying that they belong to the church that they never go to. Uh, it doesn't mean either that Australians have no interest in Christianity. 33% say they would accept an invitation to church if they were invited by a family member or friend. But surprisingly, 56% of people say they don't know a Christian family member or friend. Uh, as uh, one of my predecessors in this office once said, knowing a Christian is becoming as exotic as knowing a zookeeper. <laughs> so are we to think that God has finished with Australia? Have we passed peak Christianity? so that by the time of our children's grandchildren, Christianity will largely have disappeared from the life of the Australian community. Uh, and if I can uh, ask it reverently, what about here? Uh, the British Social Attitude Survey in 2018 found 53% of Britons view themselves as non-religious. Do you think that God has finished with Great Britain? Uh, well, just for the sake of certainty, let me say, I hardly think so. I don't at all think that God has finished either with Australia or with Great Britain. Now, the book of Acts, from which we've just had our second reading, records the very earliest episodes in the spread of the Christian message through the ancient world. And I think it's one of the reasons why the book of Acts is so compelling uh, and so uh, gripping for us, because it records the progress of the gospel into places it has never been before, where it uh, brings about tremendous change. In chapter 13, the church in Antioch, a multi-ethnic church, the gospel did that, sends Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey that is recorded in chapters 13 and 14. It's a kind of loop from Antioch in Syria, across the Mediterranean Sea to the island of Cyprus, north into Turkey, to another Antioch called Pisidian Antioch, east to Iconium, Lystra and Derbe, also in what we call northern Turkey. Then they backtrack the way they came and eventually sail back to Antioch in Syria. And in chapter 14, at verse 27, we read, when they arrived, they gathered the church together and told them all that God had done and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. The two chapters of Acts take about six minutes to read, but the missionary journey lasted about three years, from 45 to 47 AD or thereabouts. Now, here's the question. How had God opened a door of faith? What were the marks of the progress of the gospel? How did the gospel go out so that people believed it and were established in faith in Christ? How did that happen then? And since we believe that the scriptures are God's gift to his church, what can we, ex what can we learn about what to expect today in the progress of the gospel. I think there are at least four features we can think of from the story as Luke tells it. Proclamation, 
opposition, superstition, consolidation. So firstly, proclamation. In chapter 13, Luke records for us Paul's speech to the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. It's a sample of the gospel message that they proclaimed in every town. It's a message about the son of David, Israel's saviour, Jesus, who was crucified by Pontius Pilate, but whom God raised from the dead. And the message is summarised in chapter 13 at verse 38. I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Forgiveness. In the next verse, verse 39, Paul says, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Freedom. Freedom and forgiveness for everyone who believes, Jew and Gentile, through Israel's saviour, Jesus, crucified for sin and raised from the dead. That's the message, a message about Jesus. That's the offer, forgiveness and freedom from sin. That was the business of Paul's missionary journey. Proclamation of freedom and forgiveness through Jesus. So chapter 14, verse 1 says, they spoke and a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Verse 3 says, they spoke boldly of the Lord. When they had to leave Iconium, they went to Lystra and Derbe, and verse 7 says, they continued to preach the gospel. We'll see in a minute how Paul engaged with the pre-existing beliefs and uh, misunderstandings of his hearers, but the essential message was the message about Jesus. Now, there is a need, of course, to respond with sensitivity and wisdom and grace and patience to the questions and concerns that our friends and our culture have about Christian faith. We need to do that, and we need to do it as well as we can in language that is comprehensible and in a way that adorns the gospel we proclaim. And the resurrection of Jesus, without doubt, makes a distinctive contribution and impact on the issues of the day, whether it's poverty or climate change or mental health or whatever it may be. But we must never forget what the Christian message is. It's a message concerning Christ, the Saviour. It's not a message primarily about the family or marriage. It's not a message about the origin of life. It's not even a message about doing good, as important as all those things are, and as distinctive as the gospel shape is of those matters. It's a message about Jesus, God's Son, God's King, the Saviour of the world who brings freedom and forgiveness by his death and resurrection. That is the message we want to share with people. And it's a good message, isn't it? No wonder the Gentiles were glad to hear it. And it's a message of extreme importance for every person. Because as the Archbishop of Canterbury said in his funeral sermon for the funeral of Her Late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth, every one of us will give an account to the merciful judge. And in the gospel we proclaim to every person who puts their trust in Jesus, freedom and forgiveness of sin. That is a message that has changed the world one life at a time. And a message which in every life transforms that life as so many of us here today will testify with grateful thanks and humble hearts. Uh, As Archbishop, it's my privilege to go around the churches of Sydney uh, Sunday to Sunday and an occasional church in London as well, it turns out. (laughs) And uh, as we've come out of COVID, last year was a complete write-off 
But this year, as I've been able to get around the diocese and visit churches, I've been so encouraged that every little church, every ordinary church, every simple little gathering of believers in a local community that is proclaiming the gospel and living the gospel, seeking to serve that community, in every single one where they are trying, where they are making an effort to make the gospel known to interested people in every one, people are coming. And people are turning in faith and repentance towards Jesus. They may be using Christianity Explored. We're so grateful to All Souls and to Rico for Christianity Explored. They may be just uh, uh, signing up for a Bible one-to-one with somebody in the church. They may just be coming along to a session where they get to ask their questions and have one, somebody sit alongside them and explain what it might mean for them to follow Jesus. And in every church where they're making that effort as indeed you are, as we heard earlier today, people are turning to receive from Christ what he alone can give, forgiveness and freedom. That's good news, isn't it? Verse 1 of chapter 14 says, At Iconium a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. In Derby, verse 21 says, they preached the gospel and won a large number of disciples. Gospel proclamation is the means by which God saves his people. Chapter 13, verse 48 says, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. God has determined that his people will believe when they hear the gospel. The great encouragement to keep on speaking about Jesus, though the soil may be hard, though the context may be hostile, the great encouragement to keep on speaking about Jesus is that God has appointed people to life. God has appointed people to believe. And when they hear the gospel, they will believe. That alone is sufficient reason to keep on speaking, isn't it? The first mark of the progress of the gospel is proclamation. But the second is opposition. Not everyone believes. Some reject the gospel. Chapter 13, verse 46 says, notice that it doesn't say God appointed some to believe and some not to believe. Luke is much more careful than that. He says, God has appointed some to believe and others rejected the gospel. In chapter 14, verse 2, they refused to believe. They were not helpless. They were deliberate and active. They rejected the gospel. They refused to believe. But not only that, they opposed the mission. The rhetoric of a pluralist and inclusive society is that everyone is entitled to their view, their experience, their voice. That's the rhetoric. But the reality often is that some not only reject the gospel, they want to prevent other people from hearing the gospel as well. So verse 2 says, those who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Not responding to the message or offering an alternative but targeting Paul and Barnabas and spreading false reports against them to others. The campaign of opposition doesn't stay uh, just a matter of slander and gossip. It moves on to physical violence. Verse 5 says, They plot to mistreat and stone them. The opponents follow the apostles to Lystra. Verse 19 says, They stirred up the crowd. They stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city and left him for dead. God has appointed people to believe and God sends his messengers into the world to proclaim forgiveness and freedom from sin and its penalty. It's good news. But from the very beginning, this work has always been opposed by those who reject the gospel and refuse to believe it. Now, why does Luke tell us this? Well, he tells us it because that's what happened. But why does God want us to know about it? 
so that we're not surprised, so that we're not dismayed, and so that we don't give up. If you encounter opposition, it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. This message has always encountered opposition. Keep going. The second mark of the progress of the gospel is opposition. Third, the gospel is proclaimed in the face of superstition. In Lystra, there's a man paralysed from birth. Paul is preaching to this man. He recognises that he's placing his faith in Jesus and Paul calls out to him, stand up. Uh, Luke tells us in verse 3 of chapter 14 that as the apostles spoke boldly for the Lord, he confirmed the preaching of their message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. Precisely because it was the Lord's doing, we cannot say that gospel preaching must be accompanied by signs and wonders, amazing works of God. They are works of God. So God may do them at any time if he chooses. The work of his messengers is to proclaim the message. If he chooses, God may confirm it by miraculous works. But the greatest miracle of all is that some believe. They are transferred from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of the sun and raised from death to life. And there's no mightier work than that. Now what Luke records in Lystra is that after the healing of the paralyzed man, the people rush to the wrong conclusion. They think Paul and Barnabas are their gods, Zeus and Hermes, come to visit them. The miracle is not self-interpreting. It needs to be interpreted. And they interpret it incorrectly. And the priest of the temple calls together a crowd with the intention of offering sacrifices to the apostles. Now, the fact that the priest of the temple and the crowd thought that Paul and Barnabas were their gods is a pretty good indication that they were convinced of the fact of the healing. But they misunderstood it. They interpreted it incorrectly. The healing by itself didn't tell them about the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So whenever there is gospel proclamation, there is the need to correct the mistaken and superstitious ideas that already exist about God and the spiritual life. Now, we meet this all the time. Some people don't want to hear anything about the Lord. They let us know. But others are quite interested to hear what we have to say but they already have their own ideas or religion or spirituality and we need to address those ideas patiently and generously and gently as well. Uh, The uh, British Attitude Survey that I referred to um, says that of the 53% of people who describe themselves as non-religious in England, only half of them don't believe in God. The other half do believe in God, but they call themselves non-religious. 20% of them say they definitely believe in life after death. And one in uh, in, uh, uh, 17%, whatever that is, one in whatever 17% is, 17% say they believe in the power of prayer. The gospel of forgiveness and freedom always has to confront mistaken spiritualities and superstitions. And that is true of us too, because we too have mistaken ideas about God and the life and the Christian life, which need to be corrected by the scriptures which have been given to correct, to rebuke, to teach, and to train. Freedom and forgiveness of sin.
comes through faith in Jesus Christ and in no other way. No religious practices or spiritual discipline can secure what Jesus offers or improve on the achievement of the cross and the empty tomb. And of course, the non-religious world is crowded with superstitious practices and rituals, from avoiding walking under ladders to consulting the newspaper horoscopes to online affirmations to the secret rituals that people practice in their own homes, using their special pen or eating a special food or visiting a special place or reciting a special phrase to get them through the day or pass their exam or succeed in the job application or complete the project or whatever it is. Wherever the gospel is preached and believed, it confronts superstition in all who hear, including those who believe, including us. As Paul speaks to the crowd of followers of Zeus, he wants them to know that their gods are dead But there is a living God who made everything that is. There is the living God who made everything. And there is everything he made. And they are in completely separate categories. Nothing that is in the world is God. Do not worship or live in fear of the mountains or the rivers or the fields. Well, not much chance, you say, of that. All right? Real estate, music, food, celebrity, they are not God. Do not worship or serve them. The ancient gods of love and war and sex and money and power which don't seem that ancient, really, are not gods. Do not worship them. Do not serve them as slaves. Worship the true and living God. Serve him and know him. Paul says the God who made everything is good, not capricious, not petulant, not deceptive, good and generous and kind. So he made everything in the world for your enjoyment to receive it with thanksgiving. But do not worship what is not God. Lift your hearts to worship the God who made everything that is. He is the true and living God and he is good. He sends the rain to water the fields to grow the crops, to feed you, and to make you happy. He's a good God. Worship him, serve him, know him. Paul had already preached the gospel in Lystra. They had heard of the forgiveness and freedom that Jesus brings. Now Paul confronts their superstition. The creator God, the good and living God, He is the one who sent Jesus. Worship him. The marks of the progress of the gospel, proclamation, opposition, confronting superstition, and lastly, consolidation. We're told that in Iconium, a great number of Jews and Greeks believed There were believers in Lystra who came to Paul's aid when he was flogged outside the city. In Derby, they won a large number of disciples. But the mission to those cities was not over at the point at which some of the hearers believed. So verse 21 says, they went back to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. In Lystra, Paul had been stoned dragged outside the city and left for dead. Verse 19, but he went back. In Iconium, their opponents had stirred up the people against them and plotted to mistreat and stone them, so they fled. But now, they went back. In Antioch, they'd been driven out by the leading men of the city and the women of high standing. 
The apostles had even shaken the dust off their feet when they left. But now they were going back. Why? Verse 22. They returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. They returned to the places where they'd encountered strong opposition and even physical attack so that they could strengthen the believers. And part of that strengthening work was to remind them that discipleship could be costly. That's important to know, isn't it? That's important to know. If it's hard to follow Christ, you're not getting it wrong. If your discipleship is costing you something, that is the way it has always been. You're not doing it wrong. Through many trials, we will enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said they hated me without reason. They'll hate you also. The rewards will be great. Jesus has won for them citizenship in the kingdom of God. But the road from here to there could be hard. So they appointed elders and committed them to the Lord in prayer and fasting. Little congregations of believers in Jesus in a sea of hostility and opposition and superstition. But they had the message that had been preached. The apostles appointed elders and they entrusted them to the Lord. Of course, they had the Lord. The Lord who had sent the apostles in the first place. The Lord who appointed them to believe, to hear the message and receive it with thanks and trust. The Lord who had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. It might be a costly discipleship. It might be a hard obedience but there was no risk. There was no risk. They committed, to the, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. And the Lord is entirely trustworthy. Worth everything that he asks of us in following him. Four marks of the progress of the gospel. The gospel progresses by proclamation. Jesus the saviour who brings forgiveness of sin and freedom from sin's condemnation. Gospel proclamation takes place always in the context of opposition. But God has appointed some to believe even while others reject the gospel. Wherever the gospel is preached, it confronts superstition even in our own hearts. But we have put our faith in a living God, the creator who provides everything we need out of his goodness and above all, he has provided his son. And as we proclaim Christ and some believe, we must take time to strengthen and encourage one another because the road of discipleship can be hard. But we need not fear, for we have put our trust in the Lord who is trustworthy. And all those appointed for eternal life will hear the gospel and believe. Therefore, do not lose heart, but proclaim Christ as Lord. Amen.